um, thanks for coming. So I hope you learned something uh, something today uh, about exceptions and or maybe I should say about the new exception model. Um, but as I, as I mentioned in the agenda, there will be several parts. So um, be ready, it will not get like immediately to the exceptions, but don't worry, it's, it's important we go through uh, different steps. So uh, me and myself and I, uh, I just a few words. I'm like, uh, I recently joined Magic, uh, Magic Leap uh, in uh, working from software as, as a software employee uh, since April. So I'm quite new, you could say. That said, for C++, I've been coding for like, uh, I looked at the calendar on LinkedIn, it should be like about 10 years, I think now. Um, I'm not a magician. I haven't wrote uh, any, you know, like huge, uh, impressive, very complex uh, template metaprogramming library, but, you know, I, I wrote a few lines of C++ code uh, and I'm still doing it till today. So, you know, I, I could say I'm, I'm up to date with the all the new and fresh things uh, coming to the language. Um, the only two, um, like, contributions I did to the, the language was uh, uh, I got into discussions in uh, two proposals. One is already in the standard. It's uh, unlikely, likely. Uh, so who, who? Uh, once if someone goes into the proposal, the original one, you might find my name there. And also I did some discussions about the zero overhead deterministic except, ex uh, sorry, I, I wrote expressions, uh, exceptions. Uh, and this talk will be uh, covering this, uh, the, this thing. Uh, it's still the second one proposal is still not in the language so this one might or might never uh, get in but hopefully it does um i'm interested in a lot of things from the personal uh, side of uh, view um like a lot of investing etfs crypto some game design and development i love green key i know everyone used to be uh loving uh, used to love uh, like uh, coffee but i'm i lo love green tea I like long distance running and, and I'm doing cold showers and k k kind of funny things. So yeah, a lot of stuff, uh, but let's get to business. Uh, so the plan for today, and I hope you won't run away uh, at this point, is we, uh, I wanted to start why reading a proposal might be a good thing and why uh, I think many people are afraid of uh, doing it. Then we'll talk about uh, errors and what are errors, what we consider errors, um, what is the old exception model and mainly what are the problems and why people usually, and I mean, not usually, but quite often disable exceptions. Uh, what's the new exception model? So what hopefully could find its way into the language itself uh, if the P0749, if I didn't mis mix the uh, name, got in. And finally, if we have time, uh, we could uh, I could answer some questions and there's even a quiz. Uh, so if you don't like exceptions or you don't care, you might at least find something interesting in the quiz itself, but you have to get, uh, you have to wait till the end. Um, okay, so many people think, uh, why would I read the proposal? I mean, proposal, you know, before it's got, it gets into the language, it's, it's integrated in the standard. And the obvious thing you, it might, uh, you might think of is like, okay, I want to know what's cool and new and what's coming to C++. But in a way, it's not so easy because first, uh, it takes really a few years definitely to get something standardized maybe when something is really small no one complains about it it might get you know integrated maybe in two years maybe one year but usually it doesn't happen this way as we know of course the the, the, the language as itself creates a new version publishes a new version every three years let's say maybe six years those bigger changes come in so still you, you will probably need to wait to for the bigger drop maybe some compilers will introduce your changes before because they won't wait because they know you're in the standard but still the bigger standard as you know happen like every three years maybe six um so it's long time second um it might be not available in your compiler uh funny um i don't know if you if you know there's an uh, there's a part of the standard uh, there is a way of asking what's the basically what's the cache size and for example visual studio implemented this extension very early because it's it was easy for them but for example on, on gcc only recently the newest 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 compiler supports it because they were complaining that it's hard to do if you have several compilation uh, units and then they might be 
compiled for different architectures or different sub-architectures, and they didn't do, implement it. And I'm quite sure that Clang still doesn't have it. So as you can see, even if you have something inside the language, it might not be available immediately. And of course, the, the change, the, the proposal itself might change drastically. There are many, many um, like ballots, votings, and whatnot, and, and the wording might change, the idea might change, and many times it can be um, cut in, in like half or nothing will be integrated. Like for example, uh, when it was with the, what was the name contracts, which they, they didn't get at all from what I, what I know. And they were like supposed to be maybe in C++ 20. So uh, what I believe why you should read proposal, not, I mean, not, not all proposals, don't worry, is that it very clearly shows the deficiencies in the language itself. So what are the problems? What are the problems that you might not know that are today? And more, more importantly, what are the propo uh, proposal solutions? Of course, in the proposal, but obviously the proposal won't be there. But many times um, authors propose what, what was, has been already, what are the you know, libraries, whatever. And it can really like deepen your knowledge of the language. And most of the time, uh, it's, it's very pleasant, I would say, to read the proposal. Uh, reading standards is horrible. I don't know if any, anyone enjoys it, but that's do not confuse you know proposals with standards that's there are completely different beasts uh, in this regard so let's say you might say okay maybe i would read a, a proposal where would i start so you have the isocpp.org.org you go on the bottom of the page there is a standardization header and there are uh, basically a few links and what you're most interested in is that each month, I mean, not, all, not maybe not every month, not always, but each month there's a mailing available. And in this mailing, you have the collection of proposals that, that were like, most of the time they're updated. So there's like an extra vision of the update and an extra vision of the proposal. Sometimes there are new proposals. And if you have R0 or without the R suffix, you know it's a new proposal. So you might say, okay, I think I've read this proposal. Okay, this is a review 16. I don't care about this. So now the question is, okay, so there are like 20, 30, 40 proposals. And <laughs> what would I read? Why would I read it? So my like flow is very simple. And let's say the, the, the title is, and I'm taking the original title as it was uh, on the proposal. I'm not making anything up is function to mark unreachable code. And I say, okay, I remember un unreachable code. I, I, I get the concept. Um, I, I know I can use it in several places, but I'm not sure I need it uh, like re really right now. So maybe, maybe one day, but that's not really something that, 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 that tells me anything, helps me uh, anytime soon. So another example. And this is, once again, this is not made up. This is what I looked uh, in the isocpp.org. You have basic string, resize, and overwrite. And I say, whoo, I, I mean, everyone knows basic string. Like, this is a string, but uh, <laughs> on, uh, and then you can um, uh, you have a template parameter car, obviously, for a string. And what is it? I mean, I don't, I don't get it. I mean, I cannot even think what might it do. And that's good. That means that it would be nice to at least, I would say, go into uh, first part of the proposal. Like, okay, either something sounds cool and like, you know, I know you like contracts and you would read everything about contracts or you just don't understand it, but that might be good for you to understand. And then you go to abstract and hopefully most of the time it will tell you whether or not it's interesting or it solves any issue that you might found or anything. And this abstract on the um, basic string is very simple, very like vague, like optimize writing of data into basic string. And then you can do, uh, and then you can read motivation. Many times there, when the motivation is stated, there is a, a simple code example. And usually the simple code example tells you immediately what the proposal is all about. And yeah, so I mean, in this case, if anyone is cares, is like the resize and override tells you about um, this very special, very optimized way of writing something into the string when you know its length. Like you can normally what you would do, you would like ignore anything and write string, but then you would you would need to reallocate several times, uh, um, or you could do like um, reserve as normally, but then you would still need to fill the data, count the size and something. So they, they are proposing additional 
uh, lambda or should I say function taking method that allows you to write the data and not to recalculate the length all the time. So if you if you are interested, you can look at, look it up. It's a, it's relatively simple. Um, before we go on, there is a very important link, and uh, I use it all the time. It's called wg21.link slash p and the proposal um, number without the revision. And what it gives you, it gives you the latest uh, revision of a proposal in a PDF format. So it's really useful if some Sometimes some people do not re reference uh, documents in this format. So if you if you write it, it will immediately give you the latest review. So that's uh, revision. So it's quite interesting. And finally, we get to the P0709 revision four. The name is zero overhead deterministic exceptions throwing values. Uh, you might have heard about this proposal. It was presented, I don't know, maybe two years ago. Um, by Herb Sutter because he's the original, I mean, he's the author of the exception and he presented it in during CPPCon, I believe. Um, sorry, so before we go, I, I wanted to take a little sip of water. So the first question before we get to anything like exceptions, and this was really, uh, I, I'm not going to lie, I, I concentrated a lot in my presentation about this because it's really interesting when you start looking at the problem from the like the ground up. So, uh, sorry. Um, okay, what can be an error? What, what, what do we even think of, uh, what is an error? Um, so in the, proposal, it's stated that the error is a failure of a function to deliver advertised result. And we will get to the advertised part later. So we can think, OK, I kind of, yeah, the function tell me, told me to you know, calculate the sum of two numbers. And if it cannot do it, it's an error. OK, let's, let's stick with this one. So before we get further, um, what is important to, uh, to get into, like, to look from the problem from like the 10,000 10, feet view uh, above. And if you think about errors, like we couldn't succeed in getting uh, a correct value, I mean, couldn't get value from a function. There are like non-recoverable errors and kind of coverable errors, recoverable errors. And for example, the first group is the, the, the worst one, is a non-detectable, I call them non not detectable group which is like now the reference execution is invalid instruction. For example, if you clear the memory and the V table is pointing to some, some crap and you're trying to call it stack overflow race conditions, which cause uh, awesome stuff in your memory. This is like not detectable. You cannot, I mean, you can try, but that's really not detectable. And most of the time it's, it's an, obviously it's not recoverable. From those cases, you cannot really recover. In Windows, I believe you can like catch those exceptions kind of, but then you cannot really like ignore them. It, it has to be uh, considered a, a fa fatal error for the application. And then we move to something that is a kind of gray, a gray area, which is a not recoverable, at least in my opinion, errors. It's assertion errors, preconditions, post conditions, and out of memory errors. The one, the last one is the most interesting and we will have a separate slides for this one. So in a way you can think of it is like, okay, you detect it, it's not like it happened and now you now you have a problem. It, you can detect it. You can detect like, okay, I was expecting a non-null pointer here and I got a null pointer, so I detected it. But should I really recover? What does it mean recovering? Does it mean ignoring the fact that someone um, specified null error? What do we do? Do we just write, raise an exception and say, okay, let, let someone handle it? Or do we fail fast? We just log, terminate, dump, and that's all. Um, and finally, the, the last two parts are the most like non error -y kind of, is the unexpected condition in a way. So think of it, you're trying to log something into a file, but you, and you expect that the file, log file is there. Like there's this expectation in your, in your function that this should, it should be there, but it's an unexpected condition because it, you found out that uh, there is no file. So what do we do? So this is an error because, yeah, I mean, I mean, this can be considered an error because you cannot write anything into the file. And for, finally, there are partial successes. This is the least uh, problematic category. Cannot, 
it, it, it's arguable if it's an error. The, the most typical result is like when you want to fill, when you want to copy data into a buffer. I mean, you, you want to fetch some results into your buffer, but your buffer is too small and you get this kind of like, like almost an error when you tell it when it, when you're told you know we would be able to write whole um, content of the buffer but we are not able because your buffer is too small so this is kind of like it worked but not um, not in, in like it's it's not totally happy scenario as I would call it okay so what is an error then um, failure so it's like I'm I'm building up on this. Uh, sentence. So it's a failure of a function to deliver advertised result if and only if it's recoverable. So when you think of it, like I'm, I'm getting back to this, this original uh, problem with uh, message pointer. So you have the, um, this const char, I mean, obviously we have the, the, the we are assuming it's probably a literal um, const char literal some stored somewhere in memory that we uh, it doesn't need, need to it could be uh, of course um, dynamic created message but we we uh, set it we tell it to print and we detect as a client I mean sorry as a writers of the print function that this message is really not it's null. So now what should we do? And if this is an error or not, like what can we do? We can like um, in the, in, if you look at the bottom right, you can just ignore, you just return. Okay, you wanted to me print a message, uh, you give me no pointer, but is it a go good idea? I mean, why would anyone print a null pointer and expect it to be ignored? Like it's most likely an error, a programmer error. And the same happens in, in others like, do you return a bool from print telling it if it was it could be printed? I mean, sure, but still, if someone hasn't given you a message, does it make any sense? And the same thing for with exceptions and like you can throw an exception, but like okay, and so what the client will do? It will say, oh, sorry, I forgot to write the null pointer. Now I will I will send you a correct message. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, if if now I, let me uh, repeat what I what I've written here. Like a, a program state doesn't give you or us confidence of further execution, then really it doesn't make sense to have those wide interfaces that accept anything and try to hide every single possible error. Because you know, if you get if you allow such errors to just go away easily, um, maybe exception is not the easiest error to avoid. I mean the um, to handle because you have to try catch it somewhere, then still you might have more serious issues later because the program state might not be correct at all if someone makes such mistakes. Um, so the question is, okay, so let's say that um, we believe that something is not an error. So uh, we say, okay, um, the user asks us, for example, let's try this try parse on the right side. We try parse the string view. It gives us a string view, and we get will get an optional t, which means okay, we'll try to parse your value, what, what the string with you, that you've given us, but like this very specifically states that we'll try to do it. It's there's no guarantee that uh, it will it will succeed. So we can write an optional of t. And the idea here is that if the, something is not an error, it's it's basically um, a value that might happen. The, it's in, the function is not giving you any guarantee that it will work definitely, or it should work most of the time. Then you should most of the time use uh, the standard return channel. So, like you can have a create with unique pointer, and what you'd say, I'm trying to do something. I mean, trying to cre create what you're asking for, but for some strange reasons, I might not, and you have to be pre prepared for it. The same, like I'm asking you to give me uh, a a pointer to an object that sits under some offset, but for some reason you might get this, give this offset that's too large, and I accept it. I say, okay, let's return a null pointer if I'm keeping the uh, allocator allocation on my side. Um, the same with uh, wait status. If someone sometimes you have a fence and you want to wait for it, obviously you have to say it's not like you, you just succeeded. Oh, what does it mean succeeded? You might have like a timeout. You might have some 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 issue. You might, you know, it might have waited. So like you cannot just say um, 
it failed or not. You just use the ret normal return channel and say whether or, whether or not it's a happy scenario, unhappy scenario, because this is a contract of a function. It allows you to um, have this kind of non-happy scenario and you have to be uh, ready for it. And this is the, the negative example at the bottom. You like, you could have a bull create, but why bull create? I mean, why not if you can, if you can, I'm not always saying that it is possible. It's useful to keep the return channel for returning the value. So if you expect anything to be returned from, from the function, like a value, then try to keep it as a, as a um, return value because it makes sense not to waste it uh, all the time for some st status. So finally, the, and what I was talking, uh, I was talking about that, uh, like what is an error is a design decision. This is not like a hard set of rules that it has to be done this way or not. And many times um, a code base is not no fail or ready return status codes only. Like it's not like we have only exceptions. We do not we do not return anything or we. Uh, Everywhere where we where you uh, where you have a function, you need to return kind of a status result like h result or you know your custom status code result. It's all based on functions. There are functions that, that will like this uh, like this printing. It, uh, sorry, not not printing like this parsing. Parsing can fail, and this is like inherent for the try parse uh, function. If you call try parse, you, you this function is telling you yes, yeah, it can fail. So you have to be prepared for it. But on the other hand, if you're saying like, okay, I want to log something, then logging assumes internally that it will work, that the, fi so the file down down below is okay. So um, let's say you have a Vulkan allocate. Vulkan allocate, if you if you ask it for to give you a, a separate a specific type of memory and a chunk size so number of bytes, it can return no pointer. And this is expected. This is something that can really happen because there are many memory types and you as a designer, I mean, you as a programmer have to account for it. So it's not an error. It's a normal condition of the, of the state of the function that it can return something that's not happy scenario for you, but it's not an error. Still, it's not an error. So the question, if you th if you think what's an error, and in this case it's this is not an error. This is a state. It's an expected state. Why? Because it's expected by the design and by the offer of the function that this might fail. So you kind of show it to the client. So sorry, this can fail. This is not an error. You have to deal with it. And then finally, the question, the next question you can ask if something is an error or not, can or should the client act? So do not hide errors as normal state if the clients will most likely fail to handle it. Let's say you have this Vulkan allocate and should the client should the client act? Yes, of course it should. It's it's obvious. It's it's something that you expect the client to do if it fails. It has to call Vulkan allocate once again on different type of memory. If it fails to if it uses all the memory types that it can use for the allocation. So it, it should fail, but that's, a, that's not your problem. And then let's say you have the parse config file. And then you say, okay, it can fail. So I'm not returning you a config. I will return you an optional of config. So I'm not having, I'm not using error codes, but I'm saying, okay, I'm returning an optional config. And the question is, what do you expect from the client to do? Retry, you know, try once more to parse the file. Doesn't make really much sense. You can choose a different parsing function so if that would be the case, why couldn't be a function that determines which config to choose from? I mean, it could be like this kind of assumption in your code, but I'm guessing if you just give him a file, you expect you know, this parse config file to, 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 to succeed. And unconditionally, uh, you can unwrap a, uh, or fail fast. I mean, should it, I mean, if the client just like checks for the optional and says, okay, there's nothing and we assert, then, you know, like it's not really, an act of the client. It's not much really to handling to be done by the client at all. So what I want to, so what I want to get at at, at this specific um, slide, is that if the client cannot really act on the error when you ret return it from your function, then you tr it 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 shouldn't be uh, it shouldn't be a normal state. You cannot 
like put everything into normal state and I say, ah, I don't know, it's a, it's a config. If I don't get a config, you get an optional config, which might be uh, like empty. Don't try to hide it because then you, you get into this funny state when everything can fail. And, and tr you say that everywhere you go, it's a it's normal to fail. It's like a normal state is to fail. And then everyone has to check each and every function because it might fail. It's like checking and checking and checking and propagating and propagating. So um, to re uh, like repeat what I wanted to say, it's like from different perspective. So those two non-detectable and non-recoverable uh, conditions shouldn't be an errors. Those are hard failures that should most of the time, I mean, uh, be failures. They are just failures. Do not return anything. Do not return a status code for exception. No, you just log because this is like, a, a, if someone, uh, you know, failed precondition, there is a bug in the code. Someone made a bug in the code. There's nothing to help, nothing to solve, nothing to, you know, um, avoid nothing. It, it just failed. If there's stack overflow, if there's a stack overflow, it's a stack overflow. End of story. Uh, there's a, a dump. So all those things ha go into not, er these are not errors. These are like hard failures. Then you get to those unexpected conditions. So something is unexpected, like uh, when you had this kind of, sorry, when you had this, um, not a Vulkan, the sparse config file, there is an unexpected condition. Yes, it's unexpected for you because the, 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 the file should be in the format you expect. The file should be there. I mean, sorry, this is a string view. So you expect the format to be correct. So this is an error. In your case, this is an error. You consider the parse config file to return a config because this is what you expect. But if it fails, you have somehow to return a failure. But that's a that's a that's a, that's a different story that we'll get into uh, in a moment. And finally, we have partial success, or basically, you could say a normal state. If it's normal state for a function to fail, it's a it is not an error. This is a normal state of a function to fail because we expect it. You expect the client to do it. You expect as a um, as a library writer to say it can fail. So this is not an error. So some normal state, it can be partially a partially success, it can be a full success, or by basically a state uh, return from your function. So uh, as I mentioned, um, when you create a library, you many times have a problem because like you say, okay, if someone creates a, his function for his code base, he might say, okay, uh, this function needs to be it, it's expected to pass. So it's an error for me if I cannot pa parse it. But on the other hand, you could say, but in some cases you try parse. You say, no, 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 I really, I'm not sure if it will uh, succeed. I have this like try parse, try parse, try parse kind of approach. So as a library writer, you cannot re really say what's an expected scenario. Does, will someone expect to it, it always succeed or not always succeed. So that's why in, in quite a few libraries, what I've seen is that they say you have two set of functions. You have try parse, which say, okay, it might fail. And you just get this um, optional T and you are required. You, you, see, you very clearly see that you should always try to see uh, if it fails or not. Or in cases where people say, no, I really expect it to pass. People say, just parse, just parse and give me type T that I expect from this parsing. Uh, and of course, if something goes wrong, there is an error if we fail to parse. In the ca first case, there's no error. Everything goes as um, as expected. The state is, is correct. There is a funny type of uh, errors, which are out of memory errors. And these memory errors, um, like there are two groups of them, really. There are small allocations used by most functions. So if you think of it, you're not really trying to allocate like gigabytes of memory, but you're trying to create a string, a copy a string, um, create a small vector, some 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 small buffer, you know, maybe a few kilobytes used for, for fetching some data from some external API and so on. But then of course, sometimes you have a huge allocations because like you have your own allocator which, allocates a lot of memory, you, you kind of need to read a huge file. So you have a huge buffer into which you read parts of the file. You have you can have different scenarios, but usually the uh, this kind of two scenarios when I would argue that the first one, the small allocations is much, much more prevalent than the, the second one. So, and if you think about this, 
we consider, at least uh, I believe in most cases, uh, dynamic memory space as a precondition uh, for the first uh, small, small allocations. It's like you really don't expect um, the allocation, uh, the allocation to fail. Like if you get an uh, out of memory, then what, what do you do? Like you fail. That's, that's definitely an error, at least. That's an error, at least. But if you think from precondition for a function, that it assumes, it really assumes that you have enough memory in your system to work, then it goes into this hard failure. So like now you have to choose if it, is it a hard failure for a precondition to fail uh, for this precondition, or it's like a, it's an error because the function couldn't really do what it was supposed to do, but that's not a precondition. And finally, and this is a comment like almost right out of the proposal, is that even code that aims to be um, out of memory resilient and, and unfortunately frequently fails to cover all the possible avenues. There are like too many places in our code where, when, where we expect uh, allocations to, to, to succeed and we allocate quite a few times. I mean, maybe if you have a very rigid uh, set of uh, classes where there's no, phys no physically no allocations, dynamic allocations, then it might happen. But most of the time we have those STD vectors, we have those STD strings, we do some new here and there. So like, if you try to cover each and every possible place of failure, it, it's very hard. Um, so it's really, does it make sense to cover each and every sim si single scenario? If we get deeper, um, this is a, of course, a very simplified view. But if you think of it, there are like three types of um, three tiers, as I call it, um, types of applications. There are embedded applications, complex applications, and simple applications. Let me correct. Yeah. And in embedded, usually, I mean, this of course depends, but usually there is no heap. We have uh, like statically uh, organized memory, like there are some fragments of the memory. This fragment will be for um, keeping like a frame. This one will be for, I don't know, UART buffers. This one will be for getting USB buffers inside. Uh, and each of the parts is strictly connected to some kind of like um, part of the code that knows what's the maximal limit. And it's very, um, and you have to be very careful when you set those limits because if you get out, uh, if, if you have no not much memory, usually it's um, out of memory. It's like you fail fast. If if like you get a frame that's much bigger than you expected and you cannot put it like in, inside your buffer, that's that's. I mean, what can you do? Like cut it in half? You know, try some clever whatever avoiding of the problem no that's a problem it's a hard problem you can't get any uh, even more memory you have a very constrained environment you just fail fast i mean that's the, the simplest safest way because like trying to do all the crazy stuff to avoid it is i don't think a good solution um, then you have complex applications and i and by complex applications i mean applications that use possibly a lot of memory or they want this memory to be allocated deallocated and used very fast and like I think of games mainly, um, games mostly run on systems when there is heap or you can consider there's some kind of a virtual memory that is accessible. But usually at the very first moment, the memory is divided into allocators and segments. But those fragments are used, uh, fragments are used by multiple components. They are not so strictly like you can, this function can only use this fragment. No, like multiple functions can use like a stack allocator. And, and you probably heard the stack allocator is like, you have a, should I say frame allocator, I should call it. Like you have a frame, you allocate something on the frame. The allocation is just moving the pointer down. Uh, there is no deallocation. There's no going uh, with the pointer back. And finally, when the frame is rendered, you just move the pointer back to the very beginning since when this frame started. And you just saved a lot of those deallocate calls. You just move the pointer; it's very fast. And this is a like it's used obviously by many components. And what's very important, and is for each and every uh, allocator type, is you have to have this ki kind of high watermark tracking. So you have to know how much memory, in the worst case scenario, your application will use, or if it can use more memory than you expect, you have to kind of like you know partition it or whatnot. But if you like truly run out of memory, then it's a problem. You, most of the time, I would say, uh, it's like in the debug mode or this kind of not very release mode, you just allocate more 
the segments from the memory and then, then you just have a huge warning like um we allocated more memory that we expected to but i won't crash your application because obviously we kind of in the debug development mode and finally we have a simple application this is the simplest one you just allocate memory i worked on such projects uh, the applications w were quite like um focused on performance but remember if you can have a few a few uh, of those uh, allocations. You not deallocate, allocate all the time. You don't need crazy allocation speed or whatnot. Uh, you just allocate and think of it. What 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 would happen if the application found out that uh, it's out of memory? The same fail fast. What can you do? I mean, no one would care. It's a simple app. You can try, of course, some some crazy helping avoiding, but that's I don't think it it will it would help you. So. And there's another uh, part of the story because you, you can think, okay, so how would the system report that there's out of memory? Uh, Linux, for example, in most cases, will not report out of memory. Why? Because it's, it works like this, that it will happily allocate as much memory as you want, but then when you try to access the memory, you get you will get segmentation false because because there's no enough backing store to, to, to just give you the access to memory. On Windows, on the other hand, it's a little bit better because uh, you have this committed memory and the committed memory takes into consideration consideration the page file so it's always physical memory plus the memory that you can store somewhere on disk but think of it this way if you if your application and of course anything that happens uh, to work on the system at the same time takes the memory i mean allocates all the almost all the memory and you fail at some point you're trying to allocate then think of what would happen to the system and your application much before this point it will be very very slow because if you think of it you would be swapping in and out a lot of a lot of memory and even though okay the application wouldn't fail like to this uh, until this it gets to this complete uh, saturation of the committed memory it, it would still uh, you know bog down um, slow down all the system and your application so it wouldn't be acceptable for most of most of users so you can see, and and those two mo many much popular systems, very popular systems. Even if you get to this out of memory, I either you don't get to this out of memory, or if you get to it, you're you're in really bad shape. So, the what the proposal um, tries to it tries tells the tries to tells us this out of memory error. Is, I mean, this is not an error. This is a precondition kind of. Of course, you can have those huge allocation that you try for allocating the memory but as i mentioned like if you try to allocate it on linux it doesn't make any sense i mean well, okay it, it, it succeeded so what you will fail at some point and you will get a sec fault so if you want those big allocations and you know you can safely allocate them check for uh, if it failed uh, or not that's that's true but for most cases those smaller allocations uh, there is a precondition out of memory error is a precondition that's why i wrote in this slide that you you should truly look at out of memory as a, as a as a as a precondition. You created such a program on such an environment that it should work. If it fails, don't try to now like throw an exception. Okay, so you throw an, throw an exception, and what do you do with this exception? If you really out of memory, what what are you? You, you cannot. You might not even have a problem of allocating the exception. I mean, usually there for exception there's a special heap or stack, uh, but you know like you, you try to log something. You try to what do you want to do? You, you will like. Uh, remove half of your allocations and then you only allocate you know like one fourth of them like it's 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 if you if you are in this kind of scenario that you could do it and you it would make sense for your application that, that the question would be if you truly shouldn't you know do like one huge allocation knowing what you expect uh, to be allocated and then act on this if you fail to have this one huge allocation then allocate half of it and then use half of it then to allocate those little bits and pieces and then at some point fail and then say okay okay so now let's try to clean everything up it's much much easier and safer and and a bit, a bit sane to just know your high water marks and optimize around it then just assume that at some point if you fail you you can work around this issue um okay so this was out of memory so that's the um what i want to say uh Almost the last thing before we get to errors and what we consider by errors is um, you might want some, want someone might say no, Bartosz, but no, my application cannot fail. You know, I'm 
I'm this is a part of some kind of uh, flights uh, system that's in during flight control or in mountain mountain in um, planes. I'm I was I, I'm not going to lie. I haven't worked on that such application, but reading through this proposal and where people ask uh, people sorry not ask but people work on such applications. Uh, usually the idea is that you shouldn't you know, do such heroic acts of cleverness and error correction, avoidance, ignorance, you know, that you ignore kind of those mm, errors and you try to do something around them not, and somehow get out of this, 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 this situation. The idea is to embrace the failure that yes, there can be some like out of memory or some precondition violations or many different errors and you should test your application uh, and know your bounds of the memory or of everything and be, be prepared if it fails because you have you are never able to test every single scenario you should have like strongly independent components like if one thing fails it can be rebooted restarted it doesn't crash everything else uh, it should fail fast don't try to you know to try, throw the exception, catch it at some point, and then try to restart it. Hope for the best that maybe this time the assertion of the the, the try uh, the the throw won't happen. No, just clear everything, repeat, and of course you need redundant redundancy. So probably I mean in a, every system there are like at least two systems that can work at the same time. If one fails, there's al always the, another one with, with which in very very short amount of time can you know. Uh, initiate the braking me mechanism in your car or anything it really doesn't make sense and it to to you know create lots of lots of lots of correction avoidance what ignorance mechanism in your code just to pretend that you that your system cannot fail because if it fails and it is in really bad state then you really cannot do most of the time anything anything sane and now we get to something that it's kind of like inter like connected with all of it and what I wanted to repeat because it's important. So let's say you have a function and you know it's not in this, those two uh, groups. It's not recoverable, it's not detectable, don't, we don't care about those. And then you have those kind of unexpected conditions. And this is, so here we have successes. So that, that's a state, that's a, like this triparse this is this is the scenario try pass it's a state it doesn't it, it's there's no kind of inherent inter, uh, error condition it's always kind of you could say it always returns a valid state it might not be happy state for you but it's a valid state it's not an error at all but there are those errors which are unexpected conditions uh, which is not something like i mentioned here in vulcan that it's kind of expected because in this case it is expected or it's uh, maybe unexpected or expected but uh, on the other hand the client really cannot do anything with it it, it just fails so you are in this this category this blue category it's a it's a it's an error here is an error on the in, in the blue so you know in partial success what we try to do is to return return um either some status or you might return some kind of Maybe expected. This is kind of you can uh, like an union or sorry a structure with a status and a, a value. If it it might be a value or it might be failed, but you know it's like you try to put everything into this return condition. It can be a total failure. It just fails. Assertion fail fast. Log and that's all. Or finally, we get to this most interesting. This kind of something unexpected fail. Unexpe something unexpected happened we cannot really assert on it or we shouldn't as assert on it uh, i failed to deliver the results i wanted it's not my like it's not my, my fault the code is okay the assertions didn't 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 uh, fail but i have to somehow tell you that i failed and you have to do something with it i mean do or hopefully at some point do so what we get to is the ways of reporting error and we are we have two two ways we throw exceptions and return status codes. As you see, we already talked about returning status codes. For example, like here, you can have wait status and this is kind of a uh, status code. Um, but this is a specific scenario. It's like wait is in for us in this category of partial success. It's like, or success or partial success. It's normal for it to kind of have a no happy scenario. 
And what we mean is that we have a function like like parse config file and someone tries to tell us okay but it's optional that it can it in a way you return the status if you could like return a config uh, uh, comma status so like you put status all the time in each of your return uh, values sorry so this is the way so what is the problem with returning error codes so let's say you have a get property and this get property, you get a string view, of course, of the ID, and you get a, a new result. So uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not, we are not using any uh, strong typing. I mean, strong uh, template-based typing. So you get get any for this, this simplification of the code. Um, so you get any result. But if something happens, you always, basically, in every function that might fail or something below might fail. We we return h results. Of course, of course in, in your code might be it might be a different code, it might be a different name, but this for example assume this is h result. So let's say what we see. Okay, so we have a file. This file is a, let's say a struct, nothing, no, no class here. And what we do, we read. We read the props text. If we fail to open it, if we fail to read it, blah blah blah, then we just return hr failed. Okay. The same for here. We have a map. Map is like a string to string, string to anything. And we try to parse this file that we got. And we uh, get a map as an output. And if we fail, we of course return failure. That's a typical way. Of course, you could do not not read, because read, now we assume that read returns a Boolean, but it might return a complex code, like and you check if it's not OK. If it's not OK, then we fail. And what, what's the problem with error codes? Because like this property doesn't it's in a way this property um, is like a function that might guarantee that it return a result, but it might be. But on the other hand, those read and parse might fail, so it cannot be just um, no fail kind of, kind of. So what's the problem? We have no uh, automatic error propagation. That's the by far the worst problem. You just manually instructing each and every instrumenting every piece of code that potentially at one point might fail or anything below might fail uh, with with a failure and then you need to uh, propagate it up 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 and up um, you're polluting logic with error handling so it, it, instead of doing read and parse and just returning any result no you have to just at each point of uh, the time you need to do the if condition so that's like it's harder to understand the code what's happening uh, of course, you're or, or, um, occupying the re return channel, and if I, uh, when I, what I mentioned before, uh, the the idea in this proposal is that we try instead of just to return values, we try to return some results from the function, from the result channel, not a status code that potentially might contain an error. You just return a normal value. So you kind of now you're using this finally good result channel, return channel for each result, but you could return uh, std any. And then you do even auto, auto, auto property equals get property. And now you cannot do it. You have to do std any result, and then you get get property, and you pass this any result. So this I think is harder to do. It's easier to ignore, of course. We did add added the no discard. We probably didn't have it, but still it's possible kind of to to ignore because you can like capture it, but then you might not even check for the value, and hopefully the compiler will tell you. But that's not that, that it's. It, Easier to do, I would say, than with exceptions. And of course, we can't use them ev anywhere in the language because if you have a, a constructor or you have an operator, you cannot return an H result. The constructors don't return anything, and pro uh, operators either don't return anything or return a very specific value that's based on their operator. So, like, that's really not a perfect thing. Like, the, the error codes, or should I say, status codes, when you have a normal expected scenario that you should handle they are okay there's nothing wrong with having status code or returning an std optional that's okay so um but we mean errors we like something that's unexpected and we really don't want to bother anyone uh, with specific error handling at the uh, at every point because let's be honest for most of the time i mean i'm working at, uh, at a code base like this if you get an error, you just propagate, 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 propagate. No one does anything specific with those errors. At some point, you need to stop and you just, just say it failed. You log something, you, you, you repeat, but there is no special logic most of the time. That's the problem with errors. If this is expected condition, usually the client can handle it and handles it it's quite well. If it's an error, unexpected error, 
then it's a problem and you cannot do anything with it. So, um, okay, so what's the destination before we get to exceptions? The destination is that most of the code, if we can, that's of course, uh, it's not for everyone, not code, every bit code, code bit will be like this. It's like most of the things would be preconditions, assertions, straight conditions are, I mean, they're not checkable, you cannot check it. Out of memory, mem memory error, segmentation false, and all of these things. So you do not do anything with them. There's just a hard crash, there's a programming error, human error, a state corruption of the state error, you don't do anything with them. Then the roughly, of course, that's a very, very rough percentage, 30% of errors of uh, functions are error. So they can, they return normally a, a good result, but they are no, no accept. They are kind of, if you think of this no, no accept uh, kind of logic, they, they can fail because internally they have some expectations that might not um, be satisfied all the time. And they cannot guarantee that they, because it, this is not our state that we uh, work with. There's also this external state, like opening a file, they can be errors. So these are the errors and we need to report them somehow. And of course the 10% or maybe more, depending on your code base, are unhappy outcomes. Those are the partial results, the fact that try parse might fail and you have to be pre prepared for it, you have to work with it. That's the 10%. So ideas, start with no accept, because it's the fastest way it tells you it cannot fail. I mean, if it can fail, then you can return uh, that like, it, it, it should always work. If there is something really, really, really wrong with your system, it, it should just immediately crash. Then in the second case, that's the destination, is to throw exceptions. So if you have an error or something that you unexpected, throw an exception. And finally, if someone needs to, or you expect them to, uh, you, you, sh you force them to expect an unhappy outcome and they should do something about the outcome, you get into this return status code and return unhappy results. And so in order for all of these things to work and to, be, to get to this destination is that we fail fast out of memory uh, exceptions, which is not really hard. Um, there is some kind of may, maybe a mini proposal. So I, I probably it will be a part of this proposal, but it's very simple. It's like adding to a, a thing to allocator that tells you, okay, um, I can I will fail fast on out of memory. So this means that many things that uh, work with dynamic memory can say I'm no accept because the allocator that you're using is out is fail fast on out of memory. We need contracts, obviously, for all the preconditions, postconditions, like assertions maybe in language. And finally, we have errors reported via exceptions in the whole ecosystem. So that's the, the whole part now that uh, currently the, the, the ecosystem is like this. We either have exceptions that are used or they are not used. And every single function is having an H result because obviously somewhere be something below will probably or can have an H result unhappy scenario. So we have like a whole code base cover with H results instead of you know having exceptions somewhere deep that are used only when it's when it's needed. Uh, so what's the problem with all the exceptions? I mean this is a, I mean there's no try catch here but if you think this a, this a much better code you just read you just parse internally the read and parse might fail but this is an exception you don't see it you return SCD any it's much clearer much simpler to work with. It requires RTTI uh, it can be, it will increase your binary size, which is my, my, much important for, I would say, probably embedded systems where, where we fight for the flash size. We have the slower execution, but that's really not true. It's, I would say, it's faster execution, but sometimes it might be slower because um, if you if you if you throw, that's a very very slow. In a happy scenario, it should be much faster. And non-deterministic, there's another problem: exception propagation time. We cannot really, and we, for many years we haven't. Uh, created systems in which we can safely say what's the propagation time of those exceptions in our code, which makes it not accessible, not usable in cases where you truly need to have this rigorous uh, hard real-time scenario, like you're dealing with people's life. You cannot do it. So um, what's the frame-based versus table-based exceptions? Um, I'm not an expert. You can look into your compiler. Uh, but the, the whole idea is like, if you have a frame-based uh, exception, when you're going through the code, at each point of time, when you have a kind of like a destructor or something uh, that should be called if we fail, you add to a, a stack-based kind of, um, let's call a, a linked um, list, you add the destructor dynamically. So 
you go through, you add it, and at the point of time when you get a throw, it knows, okay, so this is a separate stack created for the structures, and I will call this the structures in the, in the proper fashion. Other, uh, other idea, which is much, much more prevalent and used in our um, compilers, is the table-based exceptions, which is basically record every potential um, range of uh, program counters that the, that the code can be in, and say, okay, if you're at this point of time and you're throwing an exception that I know I need to clean up this, the point of uh, those destructors, if you got into this point, I need to close clean up those destructors and of course at each point uh, of uh, of um, and there are some linked and they are linked somehow so that there is nothing done during runtime when progressing through the code uh, but when you fail of course you have jump through those tables to various program counters and clean up the memory and those tables can be huge and they take time uh, so when you throw it's slow and the, what are the common model issues? The first one is that the exceptions can be of different sizes and you cannot have like one space. You, you cannot return them in any way because they can be huge, they can be, has to land in heap or they can load uh, land in some special stack space. You cannot just put them anywhere. Uh, also, they cannot be allocated immediately when you return from function because if you think of it, if you throw, you have to wait until someone cl closes the catch condition a catch a statement so it like completely uh, cleans the like says okay I, I handled the condition uh, and then at this point the destructor of the uh, location can happen so that that causes issues and opti for optimizers for for you know this kind of throw here or allocate here they allocate uh, somewhere else that's a problem finally in order to match what kind of exceptions you're throwing and remember you can throw throw ints you can throw your exceptions you, you can throw some separate DLLs exceptions um it's uh, you have to match them somehow so you need to use rtti rtti is problematic because it of course increases your binary size it can leak uh, some some strings um uh, also it might not be as fast as possible depending on the implementation of the matching uh and w the worst case is that if you want to catch an external i mean uh, uh, exceptions that define an external dll this is going to this dll and uh, i mean calling this code is even slower and it, it you know some people reported even half a second of executions which is crazy um, and of course as i mentioned before exception propagation is never time bound uh, so it's like we, we cannot we don't know we never know if you want to uh, there's a link if you want to go uh it's about dynamic casting so how rtti kind of works and what are kind of different this is uh, a few years ago uh, youtube um, video uh, so this is kind of covers the RTTI much more than I covered here. So finally, we get to the almost the final slide. So what's the idea? The idea is very, very simple of the proposal. We say, instead of returning uh, an exception that can be any type, we say, no, exception is basically an error, STD error, that has a domain and a code, error code, and the whole size of this STD error is less than 16 bytes. So it's like, in the worst case, 16 bytes. Um, the domain is, of course, it can be a uh, H result domain, NT statuses domain, com domain, um, some uh, POSIX domain, some dom some various domains that might happen in our ecosystem. You might use one of them, uh, like like C plus plus standard uh, domain, and then you just trans transform between one domain and, and the other. And what you do is you have this union, and you have the bool success um, thing. This bool success flag tells you when you return from kind of kind of return from function whether or not it failed or not failed. Of course, this is not returned as a struct. It's, it's optimized. Each uh, architecture has uh, definitely a space in one of the registers which is not used anymore, and it could report to the higher level to the calling function whether or not it failed or not. For instance, if you think of it, you have a get property string view, and this is a new identifier throws it returns std any and uh, under the hood it would return a static exception of std any so it's kind of have the result here and in t result but if it fails it will contain uh, error so it's either error or the result if it's uh, if it's a success then error will never be filled of course so what's what's good about this one this is trivially re relocatable i don't know if you've heard about this concept but the idea is simple 
if you can move some some um, object from one place to another and don't care about destroying the first one and you can do it with a mem copy not some manual you know moving fields and doing some logic it's very fast you can do it with, with web registers we know it like there's no the, there's no, no no destructors no no move calls you just mem copy and you don't care that's why you can use second registers so this propagation of this error could be done even on the level of uh, like normal return channel uh, it's a single type, no RTTI. So if you want to discriminate what's the error for some reason, you can do just if error equals blah, 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 but there's no RTTI. You don't have to match any any symbol, any any uh, struct that you might think of. This is a fixed size, so there's no we need to for any dynamic allocations. You can it's much simplifies the the work of compiler. And finally, it's the constant propagation time because if you think of it, it, it it's just if if something fails, blah, blah. So instead of writing in every possible place, if something fails, blah, blah, it's done automatically by the compiler. And this is like a, my favorite thing about this one, because if you think of it, you might be under the impression that the static exceptions are on par with status codes, because like, it's the same, like you, if, I mean, this is done by compiler, but, inter, but logically from the uh, assembler point of view, it's the same, just if condition check, blah, blah, and then propagate it further. But that's the trick is here that's not necessarily as, as, as bad. Because if you want to go with this if return, that's great because it, what it gives you, it gives you constant propagation time because you know, you can measure it, you can take the, uh, the, the, the code, the assembly code and comp just check how much time it will take if the exception happens here to propagate higher. You can check it, you can, you can measure it. But on the other hand, you say, I don't need this kind of I'm not going to throw exceptions all the time. I don't, exception is like exceptional. I want to go to this happy land of table-based exceptions where we, you were just throwing them exceptions and only at the point of throwing them exceptions, there will be this table walk. So what you are able to do uh, with this exception model is that you can say, okay, we're using the new exception model, but we, I can set the FU stable exceptions. That's obviously made up by me. There's no uh, kind of uh, like, um, flag for compiler uh, right now, and what you what you do, you write the same code. You write std any property print froze, but you know it's as efficient or even more efficient than it was before with the table based exceptions, because it's there's no dynamic or anything if checking in your code. You just throw, you check what should you run as a destructor, and it works as fast. If you want to get to the world of very deterministic. Uh, world when you need this propagation, constant propagation, you just leave the default mode and you get the ifs. And finally, what I mentioned before, um, many, many things in uh, many algorithms or yeah, many algorithms in C++ could be done no except. The main reason why they are not because they uh, allocate memory and the allocator can fail. If we, for example, have a custom allocator, uh, it can be queried uh, at, the, at the compile time and say, okay, do you fail fast on out of memory? If you fail fast, then I'm no except. That's great. Uh, also, um, so this is what I meant before. Mm, what cool thing is that if you have a froze, get property froze, so that this is a new style. Um, if the read or parse fails and throws a dynamic exception, so the, not, not a static, it will automatically be caught here and translated into std error. That's a cool, like it's, it's, it should greatly help with, you know, like a, a adoption. And this is a, like, I didn't like it, but I know that many people are like it very much. If you think of it, let's say you really like exception, this new exception model, but you really, and, and that's cool for you that they have this uh, propagation, but you really would like to show exactly which things can fail because most maybe like 90% of your code is no except. But in those cases where it can fail, you want to have it very explicitly in your code. So there's a proposal that you can write try without any braces before any statement. And you know that, okay, this might fail. It might be a location, this might be whatever, it might fail. So you write try, and then you can, if you can see there are no braces, then you can write any code and then you can try catch below. And it knows the compiler that you'd, you're in the same like an identification level or whatever, you know, there's no block, additional block. So it will it will catch the, all, the, all those tries that you, you want. This is the, this kind of an exception, uh, extension. Uh, what do we lose? In a way, you are uh, 
if we don't allow this dynamic um, inheritance is throwing any, any any code you kind of lose the way of specializing the error code but to summarize because i know we're over the time so i don't want to to continue too long but but the general idea is that most people you know create their special exception classes and then don't don't do anything more with them than you know like logging the error and that's all so it seems to be a little small price that we pay for the fact that we could have an exception that are much more usable in all the uh, in all the world uh, everywhere there are two things also and um, my kind of connected and mentioned in the paper like std outcome std expected there are different things they are kind of work with the same problem or try to work out std outcome allows you to do a name per namespace kind of either throw or not throw but you need to use everywhere it would it's someone would throw you'd need to add your uh, magical i mean the magical uh, macro so it can either returns or throws or then you have std expected which is just wrapping the status code with the error result so if you have this is like, like a different thing like in those cases where you can have a, a happy result unhappy result but it's all non an error everything is a normal state but you need to have a rich state of return codes you can do the std expected and in this case you know that okay i would it could be sok so you get the value but it can be one of those many special codes and you have to um, react to it and finally uh, i know we would, wouldn't have time probably um there is a it might uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to ask which one of you knows the answer so just because i know probably everyone's uh, tired already uh, simple code. Consex statics, uh, you have two uh, ABC, which you set to 32, doesn't matter. Then you have a function, consex, of course, still static, which just adds to ABC1. And you finally have the consex static into XYZ bar. And you can say, okay, that all makes sense. You know, like you have a definition of ABC, you have a definition of bar, uh, everything is consex, there's no magic, no nothing. And then you finally have XYZ, which calls bar. So bar, like is defined, you take ABC, which we know because it's defined above, you add plus one and it fails. So um, I was looking uh, for it and finally I found it on uh, on, on our favorite st Stack Overflow. Uh, there is some kind of an answer, not very like clear and saying why is that, but if you think of it, the funny thing is that when at, the, at the point of calling bar, I mean, because what is said, it's like uh, the bar is called in constant expression before its definition is complete. Well, but, but why it's not complete? It's complete. There is nothing incomplete. The point is that a bar is referring to ABC. And ABC is a part of foo, which is the struct. But the struct is not finished yet. So if foo is not finished yet, because XYZ is not finished yet, then ABC is not finished yet, then bar accessing ABC is not finished yet. That's why XYZ cannot be finished. So you have a like endless loop um, in this case. So the idea is that um, if you want to uh, re refer to, if you want to use bar, uh, you should use it after the struct or just extract bar uh, and a or bar you can extract out, outside the foo and it, it should it should work uh, better then but i'm just saying it's it's funny error uh, i don't think you might have seen it but if you work with cons extra you might have okay guys thank you um that's that's all from me so any questions discussions help to glad to continue